Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I'm really glad you're here today. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode with Jen Perry. We talk about how as HSPs, we often learn to focus on everybody else and kind of orient ourselves to what other people are needing, wanting, thinking, feeling. And this can show up in exercise and relationships around food, really everywhere. And we talk about how do you orient back to yourself and how do you honor yourself and how do you get grounded in your own sovereignty and not trying to orient towards everybody else, but really having to find ourselves and orient in ourselves to our body, our perspective, having that locus of control internally and how this can show up with attachment patterns. I talk about an exercise that I use when I can't figure out how to make a decision. And so I share that with you. I think you're going to love this episode. I always love recording with Jen. And now, on to the show. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hi, Patricia. I'm good today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks. Took the dog to dog park, walked the dog, Steve's out of town. I'm functioning very highly today did laundry. How about you? (laughs) That is awesome. No, I had a really, really lovely day. I'm a little sore. I've been trying to increase my self-care by taking lots of walks. Mm -hmm. And yesterday in the middle of a very rainy season here, it was a beautiful day. So I got, I think I overdid it. I did like a lot of walks. (laughs) And now my body's like, is it a good overdid it or a too much overdid it. Ouch. You know, pain is subjective, right? So sometimes it feels Mm -hmm. delicious. And other times I'm like, cranky that my knees hurt or something. <laughs> yeah. But on the whole, it, it's a good sore. It feels uh, it's just a nice, heavy kind of feeling in my body. I think I took like 14,000 steps. Oh, good for you. Yeah, it was good. There's power in movement. There really is. Really, there's power in movement. Absolutely. I was reading that book, Burnout, mm-hmm. by Emily Nagoski, and she talks about completing the stress cycle and how just getting that energy out and so I, I really took it to heart. And I bet, you know, I'm sure I could function a whole, a lot better <laughs> if I was getting that, just that little bit of exercise. And it's true. Yeah. It really is helping. Yeah. I'm finding having the puppy that with Steve gone, I, I walked both dogs for a shorter walk last night. Then I took the other dog down to dog park and let her run around and walked. And I think I was out for an hour and a half. I'm really finding that I look forward to that time alone with her to take these long walks. It just helps to regulate me on the days that I don't paddle. My hesitancy in saying that is I've been in that place where I'm not, and I don't even want to call it exercise, I'm going to call it movement, where I'm not doing any movement and like I'm here and I want to be there and I don't know how to get from here to there. So I feel mindful in talking about this that if you're in that place where you're not doing any movement and you want to and you're beating yourself up, don't, don't. You know, what's the smallest thing that you can do? Can you put on your shoes and go out the front door? Can you, you know, walk to the mailbox, just something that's very small and doable that there's no way that you could fail. Yes. Because it does feel really good, but to not beat yourself up. Oh my gosh. I was there just like a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't had any movement for a really long time. A coach that I'm working with, I love her so much. She calls them turtle steps. She's like, imagine Mm -hmm. the next step, the smallest step you can possibly take and then like do half of that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's so helpful. Yeah. And I can remember talking to a friend that we use Marco Polo. She's in Canada. She told me about how active she was and I just wasn't. And I just felt terrible every time she talked about how active she was. It just made me feel like, oh, such a loser. Then, you know, you've been such a great mirror for me because, and somebody else said it, I did a five mile paddle yesterday. I poloed someone and said like, yeah, we only did five miles. It was kind of an easy bay paddle. And she's like, most people don't do five miles. <laughs> My thought is like five miles isn't that much, but you've been so empowering about, you know, how much you love hearing about my paddling. And I don't think of it as being a big deal. So I think when we have people that we can mirror back and forth, we get a reflection of like, oh, I guess that is a lot, not a lot quantitatively, but oh, I am doing something. Yes. I have found you're telling me how you're doing with this very, very inspiring. And, you know, it's funny. I guess it's maybe it's the 
kind of like the self-compassion piece and being, you know, both gentle with myself. And then I also love the way you talk about it. And I think what really put it together for me, and it's funny because you hear this in like advertising too, like it's not, it's not that we want to brush our teeth. We want that feeling of like having a clean mouth afterwards. So you were talking Mm -hmm. about feeling like sleeping really well and just having your body feel nice and tired. And and that's actually, I think, what really drew me in. I was like, oh, I want that feeling. Mm -hmm. I am finding it really inspiring. And after years and years and years of being in that place of beating myself up when I'm not where I want to be and in that acceptance and breath around, okay, but this is where I am. And there have been years that I've been so Mm -hmm. sedentary and not not moving and it's like what is that joyful movement what is just that little bit maybe it's just uh i like dancing in my room to crazy music even just doing that for Mm -hmm. a minute you know (laughs) like that small small step yeah but yeah no you've been very inspiring to me talking about your your paddling and how that effort i loved that week or that day right where it hit this really joyful place for you yeah Well, thanks. Yeah, my goal is 60 miles a month. And cumulatively, I've met that so far this year. That's wonderful. Some months I paddle more and less. So yeah, it's kind of a nice goal to have. So thank you. I appreciate that. And definitely as far as like logging numbers, like 14, that was probably a little too much on my body. Yesterday, I just got so excited Mm -hmm. that it was a nice day. (laughs) And that's by no means my bar. Like I can't. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not doing that every day. It was just, that was to have a fun exception day. You know, I think my, my normal is going to be, you know, maybe somewhere closer between six and eight, I would hope for as an average, but it was exciting. (laughs) Well, and I think allowing for those fluctuations and the day that you plan to go out and walk and your body says, no, not today. And trusting that you can allow yourself to rest and that when your body's rested, it will do what it needs to do. I think it's so easy to get into the measuring and the counting and the, I mean, even yesterday, Brenda was like, how far do you want to go? I'm like, I'd like to get at least five miles in. But we decided to do a shorter paddle and I did not look at my tracker to see like, do I need to do a little bit more in the bay? I thought, you know, whatever we do, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. We pulled up and it was five miles. But I think it's, it's such a tricky thing around counting and measuring and not getting caught up with those milestones and not honoring what we need. Absolutely, right? Letting that external, like, locus of control, right, versus listening into what you want. Because today Mm -hmm. it's probably looking like maybe 2,000. (laughs) Right, right. You know, and that's okay. That really is. Yeah. I love it. Allow for those fluctuations. Yeah. I think we should pivot since we've started on something that this isn't what we were going to talk about. But I think if you're okay, I, I feel like I do this to you all the time. So that's okay. You're so good at going with the flow. Flexibility is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like this theme of, and I think as HSPs, because we aren't often taught to honor who we are and how we show up in the world, that we're really good at looking externally to how much capacity do people have for us to not be too much? And how can we read the room and figure out how much of ourselves can we show up? And we do so much externalizing that part of the gift of coming back to ourselves is really tuning into who we are. What do I want? What am I thinking? What do I need? What's going to serve me? And kind of, you know, literally with this exercise thing of, you know, do we abandon ourselves so that you meet the steps or do you go, today, it's going to be 2,000 miles. That's what my body needs. And I think this is a great theme to talk about in whatever capacity about how we see this showing up for ourselves. Because as HSPs, we've been told we're too much, we're too dramatic, we're too intense, we're too whatever. And do you know what you're thinking and feeling and needing? And can you lean into that? And can you trust that? and not have that narrative of I'm being annoying or I'm whatever those negative chatters are. So I don't know. Can we do this, Jen? Yes, you know we can. (laughs) (laughs) I was uh, talking to some colleagues the other day and uh, a good friend of mine, Brittany George, she had a really interesting way of framing some of this. She called it, and we were putting it in terms of injury, like attachment, kind of like we were kind of a little bit of a jump from the attachment wounding that we sometimes talk about attachment injuries. She called it an orientation injury. Hmm. Say a little bit more about that. It was just such an interesting way to put it, right? And I think what you're talking about is, 
you know, that disempowerment, that looking to, you're not, you're not grounded in your own sovereignty, in your own orientation, using yourself, right? You're, you're giving that power over to whether it's a number of steps per day or someone's approval or like you, you will make yourself crazy if you try to orient everywhere, right? If you try to orient to what's this person going to think about that? And then what's that person going to think about that? And like, we try to make all of our sometimes our most personal decisions based on how it's going to affect everybody else. I'm not meaning to say that we shouldn't take our loved ones into consideration or, or be sensitive to other people's feelings, but we have to find our seat, right? We have to find our sovereignty. We have to find or being oriented in ourselves and in our bodies and in our perspective and breathe there and feel there and then be able to see other people's perspectives, right? And to take that in as information, but, you know, keeping that orienteering or sometimes it's called locus of control. There's lots of different, like I'm curious about finding, I think sometimes the creative work of counseling is, you know, what's the metaphor or what's the, what's the phrasing that's going to light up in a client, right? That's really going to be like, oh, I get that now because human language is limited. You know, we're trying to capture in these little symbolic words, <laughs> something that's a much bigger feeling, dynamic, you know, lived experience. You know, and I just, when my friend said that orientation injury, like I don't know where to orient from. I love that. What I was thinking about when you were talking is, and I'm having a little judgment, but this is, this is really what goes on for me. Oftentimes I'll go to a restaurant and I can't figure out what I want that I either orient around the price or, you know, nutrition information. I don't really do calories anymore, but in the past, you know, around like what has more fat and what has more protein, you know, all of these external things. And it makes it really hard for me to make decisions or not necessarily around food, but what's the most practical or logical, you know, I use my thinking brain. And one of my favorite tools is to close my eyes, take a deep breath, put my hand over my heart and ask myself, like, if I couldn't screw this up and if money wasn't a consideration and, you know, I couldn't upset anybody and there wasn't a wrong decision, what is it that I want? And often what I want will come to me. And then am I willing to trust that? And I think so many of us have had to um, surrender our needs for other people. And then we just learn to do it that we don't even know where do I want to eat and what do I want to wear and what you know, so even with dressing and like, what's going to make me happy today? Do I need something cozy? Do I need something light? What color do I feel like wearing? So really that tuning in and figuring out what it is that you want without consideration of anybody else. It's a challenge. Absolutely. And I think I look at as HSPs with how associative we are, right? Our associative brains, we really can see all these different multiple perspectives and get ourselves very frozen, right? Really paralyzed, even with something like, yeah, what do we want to eat? And, you know, layer in that some of the attachment patterns, right? If you've lived or, you know, were raised in such a way that your focus was on the needs, emotions, happiness of someone else from a really young, young age, and you were not taught or encouraged to go inside and to see, you know, what it is that you are wanting or needing, or someone was just always telling you, right? Then, yeah, wh where do we, how do we learn to do this? Yeah. It's really interesting. I'm working with a few women that are in their 60s, and this also comes up. So again, this is gendered, and I, I don't know how to make it not gendered. So if you can tell me, anybody out there, please tell me. I see this come up a lot with moms. If you talk about the older generation, it was all about serving your husband and, you know, you can, those old good housekeeping things. Put on a nice dress and some makeup and some perfume and make sure that you're pleasant and pleasing and have your husband's slippers when he gets home. This whole thing of sacrificing and make sure that the kids are well behaved and, you know, like it was the mom's responsibility to control the environment so dad was happy when he got home and how that's passed on to it's a mom's job, a woman's job. And again, I'm, I'm sorry if you're non-binary, transgender, and I'm botching this up. It's not my intention. I, I want to be aware. But this idea of having to self-sacrifice for everybody else and everybody else's needs and how often, you know, does the primary caregiver know 
which kid likes the crust cut off the sandwich and which is allergic to this and which one needs to have this that way and where the medications are and the doctor's appointments and the dentist appointments and this one doesn't like those socks and this one has to have that hat or that lunchbox. And, you know, the other partner is totally unaware. It's that mental load that we have. And how can we let go of that and share some of that burden? But all of this is about orienting towards externally as opposed to what are we needing and how could we ask to have our needs met? And if you have trauma and if you're in an older generation, our needs weren't important. As an HSP, we learned to take care of everybody else's needs and not our own. So I see you with your eyes closed and nodding. I'm going to let you talk now. <laughs> mm, I'm just listening to everything you're saying and remembering my own mom doing stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm thinking about a lot of different things. This is that moment where I have like 15 trains of thought all going in different directions, <laughs> including just like evolution, right? We're in this like messy middle of like coming from that, but seeing something else. Like I remember in some of the interactions I've had coming from, again, that feminine place, right? And, oh God, I probably read it on Facebook. It was probably a meme or something where it was like, you know, is she really being... I think the word began with a B. I don't want to curse on your podcast, right? But is she really being mean? Or are you just so conditioned that this woman in your life should always be polite, pleasing, friendly? And you're so conditioned that if she's not that, she's something else. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, some of this is, you know, kind of hard won. Like that we have these like wonderful opportunities to break out of some of those stereotyped roles, but we're still in, we're still in it, you know, like the difference between like my mom and how I grew up, right? And then little Liv, <laughs> it's my daughter. I have so much more ease around this now, but for a while I felt bad. I'm like, geez, she's stuck with me as a mom. <laughs> How's she going to get by, you know? But we're finding our way and we're having a ton of fun and I think part of that is being grounded in our own sovereignty, me respecting her sovereignty and balancing my responsibility for her. She's a handful. She's a firecracker, that one. But we, we are, we're finding our way in a, in a way I think that's very, very real and very present and very immediate and curious and open as to what's going on instead of just, oh, this article told me I needed to act this way. And what's the language that you've used when we've talked about live that I have words, but I don't want to, I don't know how to communicate with you so that you can use your own words about how you want her to maintain her sense of herself. Like I, I know I've used the phrase and there've been times, I mean, we've hit this beautiful spot right now. About a year ago, a year and a half ago, I had like a full on oppositionally defiant little girl on my hands. And now she's been just such a pleasure. And I think a lot of that is recognizing some of the power differentials that were going on and my peaceful parenting, conscious parenting techniques with a kid like Liv, who's so headstrong and powerful. I think that's the phrase maybe you're remembering is like, I've sat there and looked at her and be like, God, how do I, how do I not parent the power out of you? Right. Right. And how do I have power with you? And so what happens sometimes when we choose a set of values as parents that are power with, right? Giving kids a lot of autonomy within reason, of course, you know, following Gabor Mate's four principles of what children really need, the room and space to feel the full range of human emotions fully, right, to be able to rest in the attachment, to to know that they are securely attached, and then play, right, play without a purpose, just exploratory play. Keeping all that in mind, with a kid like Liv, what happened was gave her the impression that she was in charge, and she flipped into what we call an alpha child, Right. And it's really actually a pretty anxious place, I think, for a child to live from where they've been given so much, you know, room and choice and, and support and, and empower, empowerment that then they kind of think they're the boss <laughs> or they're afraid they're the boss. And we do this, even if we're not empowered by our parents necessarily, it's that internal, I would rather see things as my fault so that I am in control of the world instead of seeing the world as so unpredictable and unstable, which as we know, the truth of that is that it is, right? But anyway, there's an answer to that, right? So it's not about being right or wrong as a parent. It's like, what are your pros and cons? So if you're going to be a gentle parent, it's not a magic bullet. There's still going to be struggle. But to mitigate that drawback and having this alpha kid is we then 
and this comes from a lot of Gordon Neufeld's work, we become the caregiver in, in very positive ways. Like we're the ones that then can, you know, bring them a plate of their favorite food or we, you know, provide things. And, and so we step into that role, not begrudgingly from also a place of sovereignty because I've done that track too, where I'm like grumping about being the grown up, and that doesn't do anybody any good. That leads to sort of more martyr kind of feeling. Oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. But no, like really, like, hey, this is joyful. I get to do these things for you because I am the adult, I am the alpha, but it's in a caring way, not in a power way. Right. I don't know if that's what you had in mind. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that those are all really important things, especially if you're parenting a child that has a lot of spirit, but this can also show up in relationships. Like I embarrass my husband all the time because of the things that I say and do in public with my authenticity. I don't think it's anything that's that egregious, but he was raised that you just don't really speak authentically. And so I often embarrass him. We kind of laugh about it. And I don't think we have time for me to tell you a story, but. (laughs) Oh, I want to hear that story. (laughs) This isn't the best example because this was kind of, this is a little out there for me. I'd been wanting peanut butter pretzels and we went to Costco and they had a huge container of them, which is more than I wanted. And so as we were checking out, I saw this guy that had a big thing in his basket. And I said, what do you think would happen if I went up and asked him if I could have some of them? And he's like, I dare you, you won't do it. And that's all you have to do is to dare me. So I went up and said, (laughs) what would you do if I asked if I could have a handful of pretzels after you paid for them? He's like, uh... I don't know. Uh, uh, They're not for me. And I turn around and I look for my husband. We were in the checkout line. My husband left the checkout line and like went and hid. I embarrassed him so (laughs) so much, which just made me laugh hysterically because there's this part of me of like, you dare me not to do it. And it just pushes that little spunky part of me that does not come out very, very often. He came back and I just was laughing hysterically and he was so bloody embarrassed, but he dared me. (laughs) I love that spunky part of you. (laughs) That is so fun. (laughs) She doesn't come out enough. She doesn't come out enough. But, you know, that idea of we can't embarrass people, we can't be loud, we can't be too much, we can't be annoying. And what does it take to fully step into yourself and to figure out what are the things that are holding you back that have conditioned you to be so small? Because we really all deserve to take up space to know what we think and feel. And, you know, so my husband got embarrassed and he, he lived through it. And we had a really, or I did at least, I had a great laugh over it. And it felt very alive and in the moment. Or I could have been the polite, kind, quiet wife and, you know, not had a moment of fun. I love the space and safety that you and your husband have for you to both have your feelings. That little dynamic that you, I know we have to wrap up, but (laughs) that dynamic that you just expressed, like how it happens in relationship. That's my son and my daughter, interestingly. Hmm. My daughter's you, Mm. and my son is your (laughs) husband. And I can tell you some stories about how that plays out. It's been very interesting, like being the container, so being the mother, right, that's holding the space for the kids and and allowing all of their feelings, right, the full, full, full breath of it. Yeah. Good stuff. You do such a great job with parenting, Jen. You totally do. Your kids are so blessed to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope yeah. I hope someday they say the same thing <laughs> as I know I have not. You know, what do they say? We got to get it right 30% of the time. Yep. Thank Just 30% God. for good enough parenting. <laughs> You've nailed it. You've rocked Aww. it out of the park. You have. It makes me happy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here today, Jen. I appreciate it. Always my pleasure. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Hey again, I'm curious to know how that landed with you. Do you identify? Are there ways that you mark your value, your progress, your success, your productivity externally? Looking for validation, trying to figure out what you should do based on what other people do or other people's needs. I mean, this isn't one of those things that we figure out how to totally be unto ourselves and without working with other people. Jen talked about that. But this is really something very common that I see in the HSPs that I work with that we haven't learned how to center on ourselves and to know that we have a right to take up space and to be here and to have wants and needs. It's not uncommon to struggle with this. So if you heard things that resonate with you and you would like to work with either Jen or myself, you can reach Jen at Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. You can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. Or if you're working with someone or there are ways that you can work on it yourself, 
you have a right to be here. You have a right to have wants and needs. You have a right to take up space. You have a right to have competing needs with other people. And are you allowing yourself to have the things in your life that you want? You know, it's interesting. My husband's in Laughlin right now, and he was talking about how expensive things are. And he brought some of his own food with him. He goes for a week. And he was saying, I'm I'm not really going to eat out while I'm here. And my thought was, you have the money. We have the money. Please enjoy yourself and have some meals while you're there that you really enjoy. And I think that we do this thing where we often will restrict and limit ourselves. And this is his vacation. He just retired. The man should have some nice meals while he's there. Are there areas where you're holding back and not allowing yourself to have what you want because of some rule that says that you can't? You know, Can you step fully into yourself, your voice, your power, your wants, your needs? You deserve it. I want that for you. I think that's all I have to say. I hope you were doing well. Yeah, I think that's it. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day.